morning and welcome everyone. My name is Alison Hoons. I am an affiliate knowledge broker at Arthritis Research Canada and a member of Arthritis Research Canada's Volunteer Arthritis Patient Advisory Board. Before we begin, we would like to respectfully acknowledge that Arthritis Research Canada's headquarters are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth nations. We express our gratitude to the keepers of the land. I'm thrilled to be your moderator for today's webinar, and I'm excited to learn from our guest research scientist, Dr. Linda Lee. This webinar is the seventh of the Arthritis Research Education Series, which features research to prevent falls in older adults. If you're joining us for the first time, the Arthritis Research Education Series was created by the Arthritis Patient Advisory Board. The purpose of this series is to show how research directly affects people living with arthritis. Many of you have already viewed the video for this episode on our website, but if you haven't, don't worry, we'll be playing it at the end of today's webinar. After the presentation by Dr. Lee, there will be a Q&A session. Please cl click on the Q&A icon on the lower right-hand side of your screen to type your questions. This is important because there's no chat function today. So all questions have to be put into the Q&A box. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible, but understandably, we will not be able to address questions that could be viewed as giving individual medical advice. If you have any questions about your own health, it is important to make an appointment with a healthcare professional. And now on to today's topic. Dr. Linda Lee is Professor and Harold Robison Chair in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of British Columbia and a Senior Scientist at Arthritis Research Canada. She holds a Canada Research Chair in Patient-Oriented Knowledge Translation. And Dr. Lee's research centers on improving the care for people with arthritis and supporting patient self-care. Her work focuses on the integration of online, mobile, and wearable tools in healthcare. Examples include the use of interactive decision aids for improving communication between patients and health professionals, and the use of wearables and apps to promote physical activity in people living with chronic bone and joint diseases. Dr. Lee's work in knowledge translation and implementation science has led to a new line of studies on the benefits of engaging patients and the public in the research process. Her work has been recognized by the Distinguished Scholar Award from the US Association of Rheumatology Professionals. So without further ado, over to Dr. Lee. Thank you, Alison, and thank you for the kind introduction and welcome everyone who's joining this webinar. Um, let me see if I can share my slides with everyone here. Um, Alison, could you give me a thumbs up if you're able to see? Thank you, no, that's fantastic. So I would like to thank, first of all, the Arthritis Research Canada for the opportunity to speak to you and share some of the information about false prevention. And um, I, I, and this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart because, you know, arthritis and falls are are, are related um, in, uh, in in many uh, of people in our population. And uh, what I would like to do is to share with you some of the tips on preventing falls. Now, more than six million people with arthritis are uh, are, are living in Canada with arthritis. Most of them have osteoarthritis as well as inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, as an example. Now, osteoarthritis often affects the knees, the hips, and hands of older adults. And it is complicated, and, and, and this is complicated by the normal process of aging when we have a, a decrease in muscle mass and a higher risk of frailty. Now, you might have heard of the term frailty. Um, in in um, you know some of the um, uh, news and communications in the public, but 
oftentimes we don't know what this term is about. So, so let me spend a moment on that. So frailty is really a term that refers to a person's physical and mental resilience or their ability to bounce back and recover from illness and injury. So in other words, frailty is a state of health that generally linked to issues like reduced muscle strength, mobility, and fatigue. Now in older people, arthritis often coexists with physical frailty, which increases the risk of falls. 20% of older adults living in the community fall every year in Canada. And fall related, fall related injuries accounts for about 10 to 15% of emergency department visit and 6% of hospital admissions among older people. The problem is that after a fall, people may lose confidence in moving around and they may be afraid that they may fall again. And some may just stop going out and doing things that they enjoy altogether, which really affects people's quality of life. But the good news is that there are many things that we can do to prevent slips, trips, and falls. So what I'm gonna do is to focus on four key actions that um, perhaps you can try um, and, and share with people you know um, to prevent a fall. And I would also acknowledge that some of this information is actually um, available in um, places like um, uh, uh, Provincial Falls Prevention Program and um, uh, places like Finding Balance has a great resource uh, in terms of finding um, information about false prevention as well. So again, four tips that I would like to share with you. Keeping active, checking your medications, um, change your environment sometimes, and I'm gonna talk a little bit in particular around your eyesight and also um, speaking up about dizziness. So I'm gonna start with, the first, start with the first one, keeping active, which is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Now, physical activity, it's really things that we do that require full body movement. Anything that spends energy that we do in a day, it, it's a type of physical activity. So this is a really, inclusive definition of things that we do. So um, anything that we do recreationally, walking, dancing, cycling, golfing, you name it. So of course those are physical activities, but also things that we do at work. Um, you know, when you're walking up and downstairs, for, um, uh, for example, in and out of um, different um, spaces in your workplace, that's physical activity. Daily things that you do um, in, in, um, in, in your everyday life, um, grocery shopping, cleaning your home, those are all a part of activities, physical activities that we do. Now, of course, exercise is, is a type of physical activity, but this is a specific type of physical activity that is designed to improve or maintain a special or specific health outcome. So for example, including or increasing your muscle strength. That is an outcome that an exercise that's specifically designed can help you to achieve. And these are, you know, sort of also include therapeutic exercises that are prescribed by an exercise professional, of course, like a physiotherapist. Now for people with arthritis, we know that physical activity is a key component of uh, good self-care. Exercise can help to strengthen, you know, the uh, muscle structure, your cartilage, your ligament, your bones. And you might have heard of the saying that exercise or being active is like bringing food to your joints. And that is actually quite true. Part of the things is that we need to understand how um, cartilage, which is the structure that helps to absorb pressures in the joint and, and to understand how cartilage actually works and, and uh, get its nutrients. Now, cartilage, unlike other parts of our body, it actually does not have direct blood supply. Cartilage works like a sponge. So think about how you get water into the sponge. You press and release it, you press and release it, and that's how you get the circulation of, of um, water when you're uh, thinking about using a sponge. So same thing with cartilage, that when we move, through the compression and releases, you know, uh, uh, in everyday movement, you're actually bringing circulation 
into the cartilage. And therefore, when we're physically active, it's not only that the muscles get stronger, your bone gets stronger, but your cartilage also gets stronger. And that's a very important for people with arthritis to, to know about. And of course, when we're being physically active, it also helped to lower the symptoms. And for uh, people with uh, inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, it also helps to uh, lower the disease activity as well. Being physically active can help to lessen the risk of other health conditions like heart disease that we know um, uh, quite a lot about. And, and, and also, is also, uh, also it helps to maintain um, better mood and a lower anxiety and depression. So it is a, a multi-benefit um, that we can get from uh, people being physically active. Now, I would like to highlight the um, new guidelines for um, for um, physical activity. And this is the 24 hour movement guidelines that is um, uh, developed in Canada, something that we should be very proud of. Um, this was just released last year. It says that, that very important point that we need to think about physical activity, not just as an isolated event, but as something that we actually do in the context of a 24 hour day. Now, so the guideline still recommends something that we do like 150 minutes of physical activity, but this guideline also highlight the importance of spending several hours a day in what we call light activities. So these are the things that we do in standing, walking slowly, um, and, and these are the sort of things that, you know, we... Uh, does not have the same um, health effect on our heart and lungs, but they're still good for our health because when you're doing these type, type of light activities, you use large muscles in your body. So it can help to maintain a healthy level of blood sugar and blood pressure. So it's good for you to be um, able to spend a few hours in light activities in a, in a 24 hour day. Now a healthy 24 hour day also includes good quality sleep. So um, for adults between age 18 to 64, about seven to nine hours of good quality sleep is what we need. And for older adults, um, seven to eight hours is sufficient. It also recommends um, the time that we need to take a break, you know, sit down or rest in a day. So, but that, that should be no more than eight hours a day. And within those eight hours, there should be three or fewer hours that we spend on recreational screen time. So we're talking about um, video games, watching Netflix. So those are the sort of things that we, we do have to limit a bit in a day. So these recommendations are really comprehensive when we think about how to be physically active in our daily lives. Now, there is indeed abundance of evidence that's supporting the use of physical activity and exercise to prevent falls. One of the classic reports was published quite a bit of, a long time ago, but the, the results still stand true, that they look at 159 studies that included more than 79,000 people. And what they found as a group was that um, exercise such as Tai Chi group exercise are uh, effective in preventing falls. But there's another categories of uh, exercise including resistance training and balance training, those are also very effective in uh, um, reducing the risk of falls. So here I would like to highlight an exercise program called the Otago Exercise Program, which was developed by researchers at the University of Otago 25 years ago. The program has been proven to be effective in preventing falls and hip fracture in frail older adults. And it has been used around the world. Now, the whole the program is is, is home based because it's designed for people who are uh, frail and may not be able to get outside a lot. Um, and what it includes is um, a set of resistance and balance training exercise that are done three times a week, and they are done with progression as you gain strength. And the person uh, is uh, also recommended to go out for walks about 30 minutes, if they're able to do that, uh, about twice a week. So 
This program is designed to deliver, uh, to be delivered by a physiotherapist or by a nurse over a six month period uh, uh, in order to, um, um, to see the full effect. Now we know that when people do the Otago exercise program, they get good results in preventing falls. But over time, we also know that only half of the people will continue doing the exercise. So there are a lot of reasons why people stop, but sometimes how the exercise professional delivered the program makes a difference. So at Arthritis Research Canada, we are collaborating with researchers at the Vancouver Falls Prevention Clinic and the University of British Columbia to test two different ways to prepare physiotherapists to counsel and support people to do the Otago program. This work is uh, supported by Michael Smith Health Research in British Columbia, and we are currently uh, recruiting therapists and patients to participate in this project. So I spent some time to talk about keeping active. And now I'm going to move on to talk about the three other areas that um, can help to prevent falls. First of all, let's talk about medications. Now, um, we uh, know that uh, when people are taking a lot of medications, sometimes some of the medications may contribute to the, uh, the risk of falling. So um, having a, a pharmacist, doctor, or nurse practitioner to check your medication at least once a year uh, is important, or whenever you have a change in medication, it's important to reveal what, what you've been taking. Um, some of the important questions that, uh, that, that, um, that people may want to ask their doctor or pharmacist would be, well, why am I taking the medications? What is it for? Um, do I still need the medication, especially if you've been using it for a long time and, um, and, and you have new medications added to your list? Are, these, are there other options that uh, you can try? And is there any way that you can combine or cut down the number of medications that you're taking? And, and what will happen if you don't take the medications? Now, these questions are useful because as we age, the way the body handles some medications can change. Now, medications that help you sleep, relax you, or improve your mood can potentially increase your risk of falling. Also, there are some medications that you take. Um, the, the more medications that you take, the greater the risk of falling as well. Now, another important point is that our body do not break down alcohol as efficiently as we age. So it is better to minimize the use of alcohol when, uh, be, because uh, even a small amount can increase the risk of a fall. The combination of having a nightcap and a sleeping pill is, is particularly risky. So if you're unsure about whether it is safe to drain alcohol with your medication, it is important to talk to your doctor, your pharmacist, or your nurse practitioner. The third tip that I would like to share with you is to watch your step wherever you are. Pay attention to your environment, and sometimes you may need to make some changes. Now, we also know, uh, we also need to know that sometimes um, uh, so something about our eyesight. Now, when we get older, our vision changes and we become more sensitive to glare. And we also need more light to see at night. So it's interesting that um, if you look at people at their 60s, they need 10 times more light to see at night than teenagers. So it takes your eyes longer to adjust to sudden light changes, and it also becomes harder to judge distance and depth. Now we need this depth perception when we're going up and down stairs and curbs. So that is why it is so important to have your vision check every year. Now, if you wear bifocals, you would know that where the prescription changes, you don't always get clear vision. So if you have, so you have to be careful when you're on stairs or curbs and you need to tip your head down and sort of look out um, of the top to see a little bit better. So what you may want to do is that um, when you are walking or on the stairs, uh, don't wear your bifocals um, and remember to clean your glasses frequently so that you can see well um, in low light. 
And here are just a few more examples that you need to uh, pay attention in, uh, in the environment. First of all, wherever you go, make sure that the pathways, halls, stairways are free of clutter, um, as well as well lit, uh, like I mentioned earlier. And often slowing down what you do can help. So rushing and doing too many things at a time can put people at risk of tripping over things that are not secure, such as a floor rug. Now the pictures at the bottom shows it is important to wear shoes that support your feet, um, shoes that have a lot of contact with the ground and have a close heel tend to give you better balance. And it is generally best to avoid shoes that are high or uh, with high or narrow heels, um, as well as shoes that are stretched, loose, or heavy, because it makes your muscle tired faster. So it makes it easier for people to fall. My last tip to prevent falls is to tell your doctor if you often feel dizzy or lightheaded. Now, there are many different causes for dizziness. For instance, you may feel dizzy if your blood pressure drops quickly when you get up and, and that could cause you to fall. Now, so if you're one of the, those people who um, feel dizzy when you get up, there are some things that you can do. So um, for instance, after lying in bed or sitting in a chair for a while, what you could do is to clench your fist and circle your, um, your ankles 10 to 20 times before you get up. This can help to raise the blood pressure before you get up so you won't feel so dizzy. A few other tips to um, deal with dizziness. First of all, keep hydrated. Uh, dehydration can make you feel dizzy. And um, you know, for healthy adults, usually drinks about six to eight glasses of fluid, including water is what's recommended um, for, for daily consumption. But if you have a heart condition or a, uh, if you have heart failure or you take water pills, you may need to talk to your healthcare provider about how much you should drink in a day. Eating a balanced diet can help to uh, balance or uh, keep good level of your blood sugar. So it also helps to um, prevent or avoid dizziness. And finally, medications. Um, medications for depression, sleep, blood pressure, and heart problems can cause postural hypotension. And this can also um, make you feel dizzy and, and increase the risk of falling. So talk to your doctor and your pharmacist to be sure that you are on the right dose and the right number of medications. So I gave a very quick overview of some of the tips around um, preventing falls. Um, hopefully it, the message gets across that, you know, there are things that we can do to, to lower the risk of falling, even for people who are um, older or uh, frail and, um, and living with arthritis. And uh, important thing is to stay active, check your medication and have a good review at least once a year. Watch where you go and change your environment if needed to keep it safe um, and, um, and, and make sure that you have good shoes and have your vision check every year. And finally, if you experience dizziness um, often, make sure that you talk to your doctor about uh, ways to, to deal with it. Maybe, um, you know, staying hydrated or um, adjust your medication as needed. With that, um, thank you for your attention. I will look forward to the opportunity to um, answer some of the questions and hear your thoughts around how to prevent falls. Thank you. Back to you, Allison. Thank you, Linda. That was great information and we really appreciate uh, the time that you clearly put into that to bring it all together because I know there's a lot of information available to help people like us who are who are dealing with uh, with falls. Um, there are some questions in the in the Q&A box and please uh, for our participants feel free to add more. I note that a few of the questions are about individual health situations. And unfortunately, as stated previously, we can't address individual questions of health uh, because it's really important that you have an assessment and we can't assess you during a webinar. 
Um, so we can't address the individual questions, but there are some that uh, are uh, more generalizable. So let's address, uh, see if we can address some of those, uh, Dr. Lee. So first of all, um, uh, one attendee said, limiting sedentary moments per day, I like to combine efforts in order to accomplish more. I often watch TV while doing balance exercises. Please confirm, is this a good way to find pleasure while getting active exercise? Well, you know, thank you for the question. And I, I think, you know, whatever way that works for you, to be able to get up and you know move around and do something and break up the sitting are good things. Now, of course, they have to make sure that you're in an environment where um, you you know it, it um, there there are you know no nothing that moves around you know chairs with wheels for example, uh, rugs that are not secure you know that could you know um, cause you know, falls and, uh, uh, and, and tripping uh, when you're doing your exercise while you're taking a break, watching, um, watching TV. Um, but, you know, one of the tricks that I actually learned from people I work with um, when, I, when I used to see patients regularly was that, um, you know, if you're watching TV, not Netflix, I guess, but, you know, there's commercials in the middle that that's the best time to get up move around, do your exercise, um, and even just to go, you know, back and forth from, you know, to, to the room or the kitchen to get something, um, you know, those are all good things to break up the sedentary time. So, so well done. Thank you. Uh, another question here, um, is chair yoga okay if you don't have the endurance to do standing? Uh, and then a second part of that question will be using uh, ankle and wrist rate, uh, weights that you put on your ankles and your wrists. Um, are they a good form of strengthening? Yeah, so chair yoga, I'm, I must admit that I don't, you know, I'm not an expert in this area, but um, yoga in general is helpful in terms of, you know, um, uh, working on your core strength, your um, flexibility. So those are good thing to do. Um, and, and again, if you have any questions around whether that is the best exercise, if you are, um, for example, having, you know, um, joints that are, um, you know, painful or um, affected by, by arthritis, it's a good thing to um, consult with um, exercise professional who understands arthritis. So a physiotherapist or um, kinesiologist or exercise professionals with good background in, um, in, in working with people with arthritis will be able to give you that specific answer around um, whether the chair yoga that you're doing is good for you. Um, ankle weight and wrist weight, those are good. And actually even in the Otago exercise program, when we work with uh, frail older um, adults, sometimes they may not be able to start with um, weight around um, their ankle, you know, just because they need to build up the strength a bit um, before they can use weight. But certainly over time, uh, many individuals are able to build up some strength and use ankle weight um, to do their exercise. So um, the key is that to use a weight that you can um, um, challenge the muscle, but without hurting the joint, um, you know, especially if you are um, having a flare up. Um, one of the things around, um, you know, if, uh, especially if you have rheumatoid arthritis, if you have a swollen joint, um, you have to be a little bit more careful, you know, in terms of using weight and doing strengthening just so that you don't flare the joint up more. But um, we usually apply the, the two hour rule that, um, you know, if you do the exercise, your um, the joint may get a little bit more uncomfortable after the exercise and that's normal. But after two hours, it should come back to the level where you started the exercise. So if, if, you, if the joint continues to, uh, to be uncomfortable after you use the ankle weight or wrist weight or whatever resistance that you use, it may be just a little bit too much uh, for the joint. Thank you. Uh, if I could uh, just use the opportunity, I'm hearing a, um, a common thread through your comments. And as I see some of the individual questions in the Q&A box. 
Uh, if people want to uh, reach out to find a good health professional, how do you know how to find that health professional? Um, I can just share that uh, the Physiotherapy Association of BC. So if you Google the Physiotherapy Association of BC, uh, on their website, they have a section called Find a Physio. Uh, and you can click on Find the Physio and you can do a search in your area. So if you live in the interior or you live on the island, um, you can find a physio in your area and you can actually search by categories and uh, for people with specific um, qualifications. So you might want to look under uh, falls prevention um, or uh, um, older adults, uh, things like that, so that you can help to find somebody with those particular qualifications. Now, Linda, there's a couple of questions in the um, Q&A about the research uh, that you're undertaking. Um, and uh, there, one individual is wondering how they can participate if they live uh, on the island. Are there any restrictions as to where people live to participate in this research? Yeah, that, that is a good question. So for the... Um, Otago exercise program of the false prevention um, research that we're doing, individuals are referred by a ger geriatrician to the false prevention clinic in Vancouver. So they get the assessment and if they fit the, you know, sort so of the um, uh, criteria in terms of capability and, um, and, and, um, the um, the level to be able to do the uh, Otago exercise program, that's when they get uh, sent to us uh, for the research study. So um, if you live on the island, it may be a little bit challenging. I think the first step would need to be that you see a geriatrician to get, you know, sort of an assessment to see whether um, you are indeed a candidate for um, for the program. Now, having said that, um, and, and, and I think in the presentation, that's why I stress that the Otago program is um, particularly designed for people who are frail. And we know that a lot of people with arthritis are actually not frail. You know, um, we do need to move more and sit less, um, but, the, but there are, um, but, but what it means is that you may not need the Otago program because it may actually be a little bit too easy for you if you're not, you know, uh, sort of, you know, at, at the stage of, um, you know, at a high risk uh, of falls, you know, um, uh, frail uh, older adult category. So um, I would also recommend that if you're on the island, look at um, programs and, um, you know, community programs, for example, where they have a mix of um, strength and um, a heart and lung, you know, aerobics, you know, sort of a program. Those are good exercise, good physical activities for people with arthritis to engage in. Um, so the Otago is just a very sub, a, a, a set of, um, a subset of uh, uh, exercise program, you know, for, you know, for, for specific uh, population, but for the many, many people with arthritis, I think, you know, um, really that there are um, um, things that are around um, recreational activities or, um, you know, community programs where, you know, they have more structure, um, you know, strengthening and um, walking program, for example. Um, those are the ones that uh, I, I would recommend people to, you know, sort of look into in your community. Okay, so what I'm hearing, Dr. Lee, is that the Otaga exercise program is not the only option available. Uh, and it's sometimes find, difficult to find somebody who provides it. And that's okay, because there are so many other options from community centers in um, walking programs, in pool exercise programs, that all of those things help with strength and balance um, to prevent falls. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and that brings up another question. Uh, there are several people that have commented that they're not old and they're not frail uh, and they can't get into these exer exercise programs that are designed for the old and the frail. And I'm hearing again that it's fine to, to look at other programs that, um, okay, great, thank you. Yeah, um, so, so may I add one thing, Alison? Certainly. 
I, I think um, you know I um, the 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 comments around um, the programs and exercise um, you know structure you know type of exercise those are great but um, the message really here is that um, anything that can do to Im improve strength anything that can you know do to improve our heart and lung function everyday physical activity so don't forget that going out for a good walk. It's really great exercise activity and you don't need to, you know, be in a structure um, environment to do that, you know, just find time in the 24 hour days to, to, um, to, to, to make it happen that works for you that that is, you know, sort of the different way of um, thinking about being physically active. Um, and and the, the other point is that I um, is it, about doing research, we want to be able to um, to contribute new ways of doing things and new knowledge that serve a population that is not well served. And oftentimes people who are frail and older are the ones that you know, are in need in a solution for um, you know, interventions to stay active. And that's why we, we target that very specific group in looking at false prevention, um, you know, and it's not that you know the uh, you know the, the larger population who are not frail, who are uh, with arthritis and, and and fairly strong and can do a lot of things are not important, but it but the, you know but but there is the population that you know we would like to really contribute that information and knowledge to to serve them better. Thank you. Yeah, several people have mentioned that. They're not 65, so, but they are having difficulties uh, with falling. So that's good to know that they're safe to proceed with other programs uh, and checking with uh, a healthcare provider first. Um, there's a question about occupational therapy. Someone told me that an occupational therapist can help prevent falls by checking my home and suggesting ideas to improve safety like removing area rugs and putting handles in the shower. Is that true? Oh, that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Um, you know, um, occupational therapists are wonderful in terms of looking at, um, you know, the environment. What are the things that, you know, maybe, um, you know, uh, putting you at a higher risk of um, falling? Um, are there ways that you can rearranging things or, you know, um, anything that that is um, you know sort of assistive and adaptive that helps to uh, make the environment safer that's what occupational therapists do best and um, in um, arthritis care we work very closely we am talking about uh, from my from my lens as a physiotherapist we work very closely with occupational therapists uh, colleagues in uh, addressing some of the issues um, around the envir environment. So it, it would be wonderful if you're um, able to access the um, service of an occupational therapist to look at your home environment, work environment, any ideas that um, helps to make it um, safer and um, you know, it, it, it can help to prevent falls. Those, those are good thing to do. Thank you. I think we have time for just Two more questions, and there's a lot in uh, many. There's over 50 questions, so clearly this topic has resonated with people. One person asks, I have arthritis in my hands. How do I do resistance exercises when my hands are too painful to hold on to a weight or a dumbbell? Very good questions. So, um when your hands are sore, it, it's it's just, you know, you're, you're right, it's way too much if you're thinking about holding on to something with your hands. Um, fortunately, there are things that are, um, you know, available. So um, resistance band, for example, that you can, you know, use around your forearm that can apply or uh, give a little bit of resistance. Those are the sort of things that um, you can use. Um, and also, you know, if you are able to, um, you know, access someone who, um, you know, understands strength training, so, you know, um, kinesiologists or physiotherapists who can, you know, take a look at what um, is sort of the level of strength strengthening exercise that you're able to do, and perhaps they can recommend something more specific um, uh, equipment that will give you the same amount of resistance, but not requiring you to hang on to um, a hand weight 
especially if you have you know sore um, uh, 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 finger joints or thumb joints, for example. Thank you. Uh, and I think there's time for just one last question. Um, what can you tell me about what to look for in shoes to prevent falls? Yeah, so th thank you for the question. So I touch on a little bit uh, around footwear. So um, anything that is supportive with the heel that fits comfortably would be, you know, um, something that's good for um, it, for walking. We recommend shoes that are um, lighter weight. Um, so your muscles don't get tired so quickly uh, when you're walking. And, um, it, and if you need to put in orthotics, for example, um, you know, for uh, many of our, our clients uh, who would need um, that, that um, you know, sort, sort of uh, equipment to, um, to keep walking comfortable, just make sure that you take that with you when you go shopping, because you may need to have shoes that has, a, you know, perhaps a, a different size of toe box. Uh, the front of the shoes, the toe box that um, you you, uh, you you may you you may need to um, try that out uh, with your orthotics to make sure that it's comfortable. Thank you. I heard one uh, one useful tip I got from somebody is if you can bend your shoe, it's not very supportive. If you, if you can pick it up and you try and bend it and it's too stiff then uh, that's probably something which is more supportive. So yeah, that's, well, that, that's a good point. And one of the things that we um, used to ask people to do is that when you go shopping, pick up your shoes, bend it up and down. If you can bend it, it's no good. If you can twist it, it's no good. Because it's, it, it's comfortable to, when you put your feet into them, but when you're walking, when they're so flexible, it also means that it's not supportive enough. So bend up and down, twist it and, you know, then you can tell. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for answering uh, our questions. And I know that, that there's 53 questions in the Q&A. Uh, and uh, we will um, be answering some of them on the website. The ones that are possible for us to answer that aren't about individual health issues, uh, we will try and answer on the website after this session. So uh, you might want to take a look by the end of the week or next week on the website to see the answers to the other questions. Uh, so we're now going to play the video uh, for this episode. Uh, so please stay with us because this is a short video. And after the video, we're going to have a few uh, closing remarks. So uh, I'm now going to pass over to watch the video. I've been living with osteoarthritis for decades. I would say that I started probably having symptoms of osteoarthritis in my 30s, and so the journey began. I think everybody should be concerned about falls as they get older, particularly people with osteoarthritis, because I think sometimes pain gets in the way of responding to something that throws you off balance. My mom also had terrible osteoarthritis, and she had her hip replaced, and she had a terrible fall and broke her femur around her hip replacement and spent many years in rehab, and it completely changed her life. So her pain level was quite severe for the last years of her life. One in five older adults living in the community fall every year and 10 to 15 percent of these falls result in injuries that require emergency department visits and 6 percent of these falls result in hospital admissions. In older adults, arthritis oftentimes coexists with frailty, so it also increases the risk of falls. So we know that about 40 to 50 percent of older adults with osteoarthritis are also physically frail, and in people who are frail, the risk of falls is certainly higher. Physical activity is the most promising strategy for older adults to prevent falls. I'm particularly cognizant of the fact that people with OA tend to have more falls and therefore you have to be proactive in managing your strength and maintaining your strength and balance in order to prevent falls by doing exercise. 
I tend to try to adapt to try to keep my mobility. So instead of riding a regular bike, I've gone to an e-bike. I live on the side of the mountain instead of hiking up hills that are super steep. I hike on flatter trails. I walk the seawall on a regular basis. I do restorative yoga instead of more aggressive yoga. So I keep doing the same thing, staying active, but in a different way. When someone has a fall, the important thing is to have a strategy to prevent future falls. So the Otago Exercise Program was developed by a group of researchers at the University of Otago in the 1990s. It has been evaluated by researchers around the world, showing that it helps to reduce the risk of falls in older populations. So the Tagal Exercise Program has two components. It has a strength training and balance exercise component. It's a standardized set of exercise that is prescribed, tailored for the older adults, and is to be done three times a week. The second component is for the individual to take short walks twice a week. So it's typically developed for a physiotherapist to deliver. We know that the Otago program works, but it only with people do it. So we also know that a lot of older adults who started with the Otago exercise program for one reason or another are not able to carry through the prescribed exercise as intended. So what we're trying to do is to develop a better strategy for therapists to support older adults to do the exercise program as prescribed. And we're trying to test this uh, new strategy with the current way of how Otago exercise program is being delivered and see if it actually helps for a better delivery of the program in terms of what individuals, older adults will do for their exercise. The other part of the strategy that we're testing is to involve the use of an app. That allows the older adults to be able to see their exercise program, follow it, and record it as they finish, and the therapist at the other end will able to see the progression of their exercise over time. Research to prevent falls is really important. I think a lot of seniors die because of falls. Therefore, preventing them or preventing disability and preventing fatality is really important. A fall can be catastrophic for anyone. So in, in general, working on falls prevention is, is good for everyone. Well, that was wonderful to be able to see that video. So uh, thank you to Arthritis Research Canada and the Arthritis Patient Advisory Board for and all the people that uh, were instrumental in putting that video together. I saw some um, images that reminded me, Dr. Lee, of things that you emphasized uh, in your presentation. So the importance of physical activity, the walking, the shoes. I noticed the really good shoes with the laces. I noticed the walking poles. I noticed the handrails on the stairs. I noticed there were no scatter rugs uh, in the home. Uh, all of those kinds of things. So it was nice to be able to see the video to reinforce the, the key messages that you gave. Um, I noticed that there was a question in the chat box, uh, sorry, in the Q&A again, about the location of how to find a physio. Um, so we will put it up on uh, the website. It's posted in the Q&A, uh, but it is the physiotherapy Association of British Columbia, and then find a physio. Okay, so that's, and you can find a physio in your area, pick up the phone and speak to them and say, do you do the Otago exercise program? And if not, as Dr. Lee has stated, um, that's not the only exercise program. Uh, so you can certainly have an assessment and determine what kind of exercise and ask all those questions that we were not able to answer today um, in the Q&A. So I just really want to thank you, Dr. Lee, for uh, an excellent presentation. Um, but I'd also really like to thank the over 200 people who joined us today and all of those who will watch the recording. 
Um, we will be sending a quick survey to the people who attended today, and we hope that you'll take a few minutes to complete it because your feedback is super important for developing future education series episodes. And as a bonus, everyone who completes our survey by April 15th will be entered into a draw for a $20 Starbucks card. So I would like to thank the Arthritis Research Education Series sponsors. Um, these are companies who have provided some funds that help to pay for putting this kind of production together. So I'd like to specifically acknowledge Fresnius Cabby Canada, GlaxoSmithKline, Novartis, Janssen, Organon, and Teva Pharmaceuticals. And finally, a special thank you to Dr. Linda Lee. We're grateful to have had the opportunity to learn about your research on preventing falls. And I know on our website, if people want to be a part of the research, they're certainly welcome to look at what that research is about and any of the research projects that any of the scientists at Arthritis Research Canada are currently undertaking. And you might want to check that website frequency be, frequently because there's always new projects uh, and there's other opportunities to become involved. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to visit the website and check out other arthritis research education series, I encourage you to do so. And this episode will be posted soon and we'll be offering you other additional resources on the webpage. So thanks to everybody. I hope you all enjoy a nice walk in the sunshine today. <laughs>